Okay, good afternoon. Uh, uh, I think now that we are fortified with some nice kachoris and coffee, uh, time for some more uh, thought process. <clears throat> we are going to speak about oxygen therapy and uh, new forms. Well, firstly, what's hypoxemia and what is hypoxia? They are often uh, terms which are used interchangeably. Hypoxemia refers to low PO2 or partial pressure of oxygen in the blood and hypoxemia occurs when oxygen supplies are sufficient to meet the oxygen demand in a particular compartment. So alveolar or tissue. Tissue hypoxia may be further subdivided into hypoxic, anemic, histotoxic, stagnant, etc. I am sure you know the various definitions. <clears throat> These are the various uh, modes in which we oxygenate our patients. So we will quickly go through some of them and go to the relatively newer stuff. So low flow systems and high flow systems. Low flow uh, contribute partially to the inspired breaths of patient and these examples are nasal cannula, simple mask, etc. High flows deliver specific and constant percentage of oxygen independent of patient's breathing such as venturi mask, track collar, TPs, etc. So this is what a nasal cannula looks like. We use it day in and day out and we can deliver something like 24 to up to 44 percent oxygen FiO2 through this cannula and each liter is uh, roughly 4 percent <coughs> addition. The advantage is it's simple to put, quick, cheap and easily well tolerated patient can continue to speak and eat and drink without any disadvantage. Uh, occasionally it can cause in high flows can cause nasal drying and can be a little problem if somebody is a mouth breather has got nose which is blocked and potentially over a long period of time can cause skin irritation. Then comes various kind of mask. Simple mask are uh, something we use every day. They are just uh, uh, something which pops onto the nose and the, and the mouth and you can adjust with the metal clip delivers between 35 to 60 percent oxygen and we can deliver between 6 to 10 liters uh, flow rate into it. Often used when we need more oxygen than, than a nasal cannula would deliver and this is what it looks like. I think all of you know it. Advantage again is increased delivery of oxygen for short period of time. Disadvantage could be potential skin irritation, sometimes a feeling of claustrophobia and it does not control the FI2 so can be a problem in CO2 retainers. <clears throat> partial rebreathing mask is used to deliver oxygen concentration up to 80 percent. It allows uh, there is a reservoir bag which must remain inflated both in the both phases of respiration. It collects part of the patient's exhaled air and remaining exhaled air exits through the vents. It again requires a fairly tight control. A non rebreathing mask also looks very similar but it can deliver between 95 to 100 percent oxygen between uh, with a flow rate of 6 to 15 liters per minute. It's got a uh, two one-way valves so the expired air goes out and you get much higher concentration of oxygen. Uh, it's not good for long-term use. It's okay for uh, short-term use in the hospital and of course useful for patient breathing spontaneously and while we either improve the patient with a medical therapy or we move on to higher levels of support can of course lead to CO2 retention. So both look very similar. One has a valve and one does not have a rebreathing, uh, does not have a valve. Then venturi mask again an old one which we all aware oxygen uh, up to 40 to 50 percent can be delivered and they at various flow rates. They usually come with colored uh, colored venturis which is marked to say what FIU2 will deliver with what liters of flow rate and if we adjust to that we will get it, get approximately that. Of course we know the principle it entrains oxygen, uh, entrains air to dilute the oxygen which is coming because the pressure drops because the, once the oxygen coming through the pipe suddenly expands there is a drop in pressure. So that uh, negative pressure or drop less pressure allows some of the air to come in and dilute it and that is how we get a mixture of air and oxygen. The other uh, contraptions used are oxygen wood. You usually will not see it except in P3 
pediatric uh, practice and similarly in oxy and tent these are uh, rarely in the seen in the uh, adult domains and of course the ubiquitous ambu bag which has a reservoir uh, which if you attach with the reservoir back we usually do that so it gives much higher concentration of oxygen you can also attach a p valve to it and i think we are very familiar with this coming to tracheostomy collar and mask well we can give oxygen just with a mask just like we do it over a nose or a face mask and they are they are called tracheostomy the mask you get it this is what they look like it just pops on on top of a tracheostomy tube tps uh, we are all familiar with it uh, it can give high fi2 things uh, but a humidification can be a problem then this is not exactly bipaps are not exactly oxygenation device but all our patients on bipap virtually all our patients on bipap are also being given oxygen so we never really know what is the fio2 so these are couple of papers i managed to pull out and few things that this uh, this particular study was done on a on a lung model and they basically in put oxygen at various points so this is the mask this is the flow generator so you put either uh, put oxygen in the middle of the tube or put oxygen close to the expiratory valve or put oxygen through the ventilator <coughs> for a given f oxygen flow the fio2 was greatest when oxygen was connected just before the exhaust port that's something we need to remember the other thing is that it depends fio2 uh, actual fio2 delivered depends on several things one is point where oxygen is added just like i mentioned the level of inspiratory positive airway pressure and the oxygen flow rate so these are the findings in that particular study so these are the various flow rates these are the various ipaps and these are the measured fio2 being actually delivered it does not depend on respiratory rate or on the tidal volume so these are good guides many of our calculations including pf ratios we at least get some idea if we have this table in front of us this is a study done on i think 11 or 12 patients very small numbers again they connected oxygen at various points and they found that there was no significant uh, difference between oxygen concentration achieved by either route whether near the mask or uh, near the mask or distal from the mask Uh, this one as was the finding on this and it found that for 1 liter oxygen supplies 31% oxygen 2 liters 37 3 liters 40% 4 liters 44% 5 and 6 liters approximately give 46% now this this was uh, this was the finding in this particular study but the fio2 delivered is not constant so in one of these patients had a mini track in place so they put an oxygen probe down that uh track and they measured the oxygen so as you can see inspiration and expiration there is actually a dif difference in the fio2 the fio2 can change during expiration and inspiration and these are the various uh, oxygen flow rates uh, and this is the tracheal oxygen concentration so this is actual measurement in in one patient so these are two papers you can keep in mind to get an estimate of what fio2 the patient is getting coming to a uh, high flow nasal cannula oxygen therapy which is relatively new not very new most of us are using it now the as we know purpose of uh, respiratory support is to take care of the co2 and the po2 adequate alveolar ventilation is essential to throw out co2 and uh, currently of course we use either niv or mechanical ventilation how our poor mask tolerance in niv is a problem high flow cannula uses a delivery system which which is like a oxygen cannula where it delivers much higher rates of uh, flow rate and it is humidified and we can control the fio2 of this patient uh, uh, accurately so it's been estimated that a breathless patient respiratory respiratory rates are high their their flow rate requirement is as much as 30 to 
100 liters per minute whereas a normal cannula would deliver around a few uh, three four liters a mass would deliver up to 15 liters and high flow uh, nasal cannula gives much higher gives very high rates up to i think 60 liters you can go up to and that's the advantage and this has been now been tried in various conditions so what it consists of is a humidifier system a humidifier this is a nasal cannula and this is where the oxygen uh, we can dial in the FiO2 that we want so it's getting an exact FiO2 getting a uh, humidification and therefore the patient is able to tolerate very high rates which normally patients are unable to do and it's probably matching their, their flow rate requirement so that's another picture of the same and we can also deliver this same system to a tracheostomy attachment. So this sits over the tracheostomy and the same flow rates humidified fixed FiO2 uh, can be given through the, through the tracheostomy tube as well. <coughs> the earliest data came from neonatology and they found that it reduced the anatomical dead space had some peep effect and a constant fraction of FiO2 and of course good humidification. So how did it work? It probably worked by lavaging out the nasopharyngeal space. So although unlike a non-invasive ventilation, we were not giving a tidal volume. This high flow rate was literally washing out the nasopharyngeal place, so decreasing the dead space and was able to clear CO2 to an extent and also provide certain amount of peak. Uh, three four uh, centimeter, uh, three four of peep, not more than that. The uh, if the patient had an open mouth, the CO2 clearance was more. And patients usually did not complain of drying of mouth or nose. So that's that's a big advantage. So so this is this is a study which uh, looked at they measured pressures and they found the nasopharyngeal pressures increased to 2.7 plus minus 1 centimeter water with mouth closed and less with mouth open with face mass of course compared to that was zero the other authors have also reported positive pharyngeal pressure uh, which is affected by gender body mass index mouth closed open of course and flow rates with a closed mouth pharyngeal pressures increase with open mouth even a 60 liters per minute flow rate in the P pharyngeal pharynx remains below 3 centimeters of water. So that's probably the max uh, pressures that we can generate. <coughs> the, whether this works in uh, whether the patient is supine or in prone posture in end expiratory lung volumes by electrical impedance in a particular study with, uh, with nasal cannula did not change and the mean airway pressures remain the same. Uh, also uh, depends on the uh, fraction inspired oxygen also depends on calm breathing and rapid breathing so it does change actual amount delivered to the patient how what was their breathing pattern we can skip this so humidification as they, one of these studies have found that a, as little as 5 minutes of ambient gas delivered directly to the trachea can cause significant decrease in pulmonary compliance and conductance in infants. So breathing air unless it is going through an intact nasopharyngeal space can be highly harmful to the uh, respiratory tract and using a humidified, well humidified uh, flow rate, even high flow rates is good for the patient. The gas which is humidified properly improves mucosolytic functions, facilitates clearance of secretions, associated with less atelectasis, minimizes airway construction and reduces work of breathing. So where do we use? We use in hypocapnic patients, hypoxemic patients, post-extubation, pre-intubation oxygenation, some OSA patients, acute heart failure for doing a bronchoscopy and in patients uh, who have do not intubate status or patients with a
contraindication to NIV where you would otherwise consider an NIV. So these are various studies. Uh, this study, Miller 2014 reported successful use in uh, hypercapnic respiratory failure <coughs> in patients unable to tolerate NIV, conventional NIV. This was a study in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and they found that CO2 washout effect in upper airway anatomical space may contribute to beneficial effect of the instrument. Uh, HNF, uh, HFNC resulted in significant effects on respiratory parameters in the patient both in obstructive and restrictive pulmonary diseases. This is uh, yet another study on COPD. We go straight to uh, first six weeks they uh, get, gave non-humidified air, uh, hang on, na nasal, sorry, nasal high flow air. 20 liters per minute and next six weeks patient was switched to NIV. Patients were instructed to use device for more than five hours per day and to maintain stable oxygen. The primary outcome parameter was capillary PCO2, three hours following the end of treatment during night. No difference in PCO2. So although we were giving much higher oxygen uh, concentration uh, in general, there, there was no difference in PCO2 as compared to NIV. So it, it is an option. And so, uh, nasal uh, humidified high flow oxygen may be uh, alternative treatment in stable hypercapnic COPD patients. <coughs> so this is a study in critical ill patients with uh, acute respiratory failure. Uh, if the oxygen uh, SpO2 was, uh, was a monocentric study, we go straight to the results. The significantly reduced respiratory rate, heart rate, dyspnea score, uh, it improved in 15 minutes of starting the device. One hour after uh, starting, the PO2 uh, had improved, the PF ratio had also improved. These improvements lasted throughout the study period. <coughs> mean duration of use in this study was three days. It was never interrupted in any patient because of intolerance. So tolerance is fantastic and of course no nosocomial infection because you hadn't put a tube down their throat. Skip this. This is an important study, Florali study. Uh, this was done in multicentric open label trial, inclusion of more than 18 years respiratory rate more than uh, 25, PF ratio less than 300, PCO2 was within normal range and there was absence of clinical history of chronic respiratory failure. So this proportion of patients intubated at 28 days was the primary outcome and these are the figures. So first is the intubation rate, as the, the red is the high flow nasal cannula, the intubation rates are uh, were less though not significantly less, the ventilator free days was significantly better. This is the red one is the ventilator free days. Just jumps. So standard oxygen versus high flow, the uh, hazard ratio for death was less. So this is survival again highest with uh, high flow nasal cannula. And there was a significant difference in favor of high flow oxygenation in 90 days mortality. So that, that's a very interesting uh, paper. Something which looks very similar to a nasal cannula was actually improving mortality in these patients. This was a study done in 2009 in H1N1. And uh, what did they find? These were mortality, those patients who managed on conventional oxygen therapy was 0%, obviously they were the least sick. Then about 20 odd patients were put on high flow nasal cannula, some 9 of them succeeded, mortality was 5, 0%, 11 which did not succeed had to be intubated, mortality rate was 27%, this was at least numerically more than those who were initially mechanically ventilated. So, uh, this is 20, 20% per, 20 versus 27%. So patients who did well, this is similar to data from non-invasive ventilation. If the patients respond 
to non-invasive ventilation, their mortality is least. However, if they then need to be intubated, they are some, the mortality often is more than those directly intubated. So, you need patient selection is important, number one. Number two, a fairly early uh, decision needs to be taken whether the patient is doing well and we or we need to take them straight to in, intubation. So, what may happen when we use either an IV or a high flow nasal cannula is we keep on waiting and waiting till patient eventually deteriorates. That should not happen. So, this is a study in a uh, mild, I, I assume mild ARDS and they again use high flow nasal cannula and they found that the daily care over one fourth of subjects requiring NIV were treated with high flow nasal cannula with high success rate in subjects with severe ARDS. So, they even had uh, patients who were uh, managing on ARDS, but I doubt they will work on very severe uh, ARDS. So, it's it's a potentially usable uh, in ARDS patients also, but obviously we need to keep a very close eye on them. Post extubation, uh, several studies have shown that post extubation where you suspect there is a high chance of re-intubation, a high flow nasal cannula may, may decrease that. This is again an important study, opera trial compared to early nasal high flow therapy stand versus stand with standard care to prevent post-op hypoxemia after abdominal surgery. And the pre-intubation pre oxygenation. Authors concluded that high flow nasal cannula significantly reduced the prevalence of severe hypoxemia and that is used could improve patient safety during intubation in ICU. It's been used in patients uh, with sleep apnea, especially those with uh, uh, stroke, where the acceptance of a patient with, of an NIV may not be so great. It's been used in, in situations of acute heart failure, similar to our use of NIV, and it's been used for bronchoscopy. So, in critical care, patients, we often do bronchoscopies on patients and when we do bronchoscopies, numerous physiological changes take place. They, as soon as we put a suction, their lungs get de-recruited. When we give sedation for bronchoscopy, if we do, then their airway uh, reflexes get somewhat obtunded and uh, when we put saline down the bronchoscope to do bronchialveolar lavage, it can cause at least transient decrease in uh, transient decrease in PF ratios. So all of this, and of course you're putting a bronchoscope through the airway, which is uh, kind of uh, taking care of a normal bronchoscope would uh, occupy about 10 to 15 percent of the airway of a of a size 8 uh, endotracheal tube. So the peak pressures may go up during the procedure. So, bronchoscopy has its own problems. In a non-intubated patient, uh, we may potentially tip the patient towards intubation. There are many situations. The way, way around it is either not to do a bronchoscopy. Sometimes we choose not to do a bronchoscopy if we feel clinically that this patient will be completely tipped off into intubation or we use a non-invasive ventilation and through an NIV mask we do a bronchoscopy, we get away with it and this is a third method which is to put a non uh, high flow nasal cannula and under its cover uh, do the bronchoscopy. And in this uh, case, particular case, they found that this was useful to prevent hypoxemia during the procedure. Then just like NIV, in patients who have do not intubate status, for instance, end stage malignancy, metastasis everywhere, they are in respiratory failure, they want to do something, they are finding it difficult to uh, tolerate non-invasive ventilation, uh, high flow nasal cannula could be a potential use and has been used in varieties of patients and found to be useful. Any condition where you don't want to intubate an NIV is contraindicated. So, you can think of various things. For instance, the usually in ICUs we use a full face mask. So, the patient's consciousness level is not too good 
there is a risk of increasing aspiration post vomiting so using a open system like a nasal cannula hypo nasal cannula uh, at least avoids that so that could be an indication for uh, for using uh, non hypo nasal cannula and you all know various so called contraindications to using a niv so in conclusion hypo nasal cannula delivery uh, oxygen delivery is provided to be valuable aid has been gaining attention as an alternative means of respiratory support uh it is effective both in hypercapnic and in hypoxic uh, respiratory failure and we can see it as an additional step so to begin with we had only two steps one was conventional oxygenation and patient not doing well got intubated that's how we used to do when uh, in my younger days then came non invasive ventilation so is provided a step in between so you could get away with a lot of patients just by using non invasive ventilation tied over a period while their medications etc took their action and not intubate the patient now there is a yet another modality which could be seen as something in between niv and conventional oxygenation <coughs> so you could potentially a patient who is on uh, not managing just an oxygenation put on high flow nasal cannula if that's not working you can switch them to niv if that's not working you can intubate also the niv and the high flow nasal cannula could be used simultaneously i'll tell you uh, how we should we can do that a patient who is uh, on niv and is conscious otherwise you would like to get them off the niv get them to drink some water get them to eat get them to communicate and also take the pressure of the mask of their face the one way we can do is to in between patients who are requiring otherwise con almost continuous niv support we can give them intermittent high flow nasal cannula so while when they are feeding or when they are talking or drinking we can use high flow nasal cannula and put back niv so that one could as the patients get better we could potentially use high flow nasal cannula during day time and when they are sleeping put a non invasive ventilation so we can combine both the modalities and get get away without needing to intubate this patient thank you so much Thank you sir